we just found two bags in the shed and it's flies all I, I think they're in the shed in, in a bag, okay? And I'm just scared to open it. Okay, we don't want you to touch anything, okay? So let's just see what we got first and our Yeah, I mean we don't even know what we have. That doesn't look normal. Get everybody out here. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are going to the year of 2018, if you can believe that. Mad stuff, I know. And we're gonna talk about Sarah and Brian, as one guy, and Danielle Marzenchko, that's a gal, who were, you know, teens living just outside of Detroit, Michigan, and they went missing from there. At first, people thought, you know, well, it's kind of strange they're not around, but maybe they're just off chilling. This is during, you know, the long hot dog days of summer. I'm sure they're fine. And it was a long hot summer, real hot, because a couple of days later, uh, people started to notice a smell coming from the shed out back. And that's when the real case began. So, I mean, you know what that means, like, let's give it a go. It was the 23rd of August, 2018, that our story gets off to a start. And it starts in a mobile home in Clinton Township. Clinton Township sits northeast of Detroit proper, about 30 minutes away. As a suburb of the city, about 100,000 people live there, and it's just fine for the most part. So in Clinton, you'll find a pretty extensive mobile home park, and one of those was rented by a Robert Joseph Merzejka. Now, Robert Joseph, who I'll just refer to as Joseph, because his son was also named Robert, he lived in a house with his three children. You had Danielle Marzejka, his son Robert Marzejka, 24 years old, and then Kevin, 23 years of age. Danielle was the youngest of the kids, but I mean she was 18 years old, so not exactly like a child or anything. Joseph's wife and the mother of his children, Jill, she sadly passed away seven years before our story uh, begins. She passed away in 2011. Danielle lived in that home with her boyfriend also, Saren Bryan. Danielle and Saren had been dating for years, and he was initially living an hour and a half away with his family. Though he was making the trip like up and down so often, it was just kind of like one of those, shit, may as well live together, move in together. Save on gas. Why not? So Danielle and Saren had a room, Robert had a room, Kevin and his girl Aaron had a room, and uh, Joseph, the dad, you know, who rented, rented the whole place, he would sleep on the couch, giving the bedrooms to, to his children, which is like, fair play to you. Joseph, he worked as a painter, like a, like a general contractor, and his two sons, Kevin and Robert, they would often work with him, especially, you know, when, when they needed some money, and they had white work vans that they would drive around in using for work and for pleasure. So that's what the men in the Marzejka family done did. What Danielle herself did was work the night shift at National Coney Island, a chain of restaurants in the greater Detroit area. And Sarah and her boyfriend, he done work there too. They'd been working there for a few weeks, you know, by the time our story uh, begins. Summer jobs for both Danielle and Sarah. Now, neither of them had a car. Danielle Saren didn't have a car. So when they were going to work, they would often grab a ride with a friend of theirs who also worked at this place. On the 22nd of August, 2018, Danielle, Saren, and this friend of theirs, they all drove to work beginning the 9 p.m. shift. They would, they would always do night shifts. They were there, so, you know, working through the night. Another day on the rig before this friend dropped Danielle and Saren off at their home at 8 a.m., the following morning, you know, and as they were walking in, you know, after a long night going to go to bed, uh, Joseph was walking out, about to start his day. Joseph said goodbye to uh, his daughter and her boyfriend, and off he went. And that, that was the last time Saren or Danielle were seen alive. That evening, now the, the 23rd of August, both Danielle and Saren, they were scheduled in for another night shift at Coney's. Now this particular day, the friend who would always bring them to work, she said she, she would message Danielle saying she couldn't, her car 
It's Fox. She, can, she couldn't give them a, a lift that day. And she sent this message, message to Danielle at 1 p.m. saying, all right, we're gonna need to sort something else out to get to work later on. Then, four hours later at 5 p.m., she messaged Danielle again saying, all right, my car is like done for, but hey, sort it out, I got, I got another ride for us. Then at 7 p.m., she texted Danielle for a third time saying, uh-oh, uh, the ride fell through. Sorry, we need to sort something out because you have to be in, you know, in two hours to start at nine. And none of these messages reached Danielle. And this struck a friend as, as really, really weird because Danielle always replied to messages. I mean, especially if it's messages, you know, about work where she kind of needed to be somewhere that evening. It was just very, very odd. Like it wasn't, she didn't even get, you know, the message scene, little message thing you get on Facebook. Like Danielle was always on the phone. She was always on social media, always texting, always on like whatever, to the point where Danielle carried a charger around with her, like in her handbag. That's how on, I don't know anybody who carries a charger around with them unless it's like a work thing. But Danielle was always like, that's, so that's, it's weird then when she doesn't get back to you. It was her lifeline to the world outside of Clinton Township, but it seemed that had gone dead. So the friend was thinking, all right, you know, a million different things could run through your mind. It could be a million different answers to the question of what's going on. So she said, all right, listen, I'll, I'm sure I'll see Danielle and Saren at work later on that day. No sweat. She didn't. They missed the shift and that worried the friend then even more. They were responsible people. Now, something's up. Something's wrong. The next day, the next morning after finishing her shift, the friend went to the house, went to Danielle and Saren's house. Joseph and Robert were there. Let the friend in, she had a look around. She had a look around her bedroom. Um, it was a bit all over the place. She saw Danielle's charger was right there, so it's not like they had run, run off or anything like that. She called around to a couple of her friends. Nobody had seen them. Nobody had seen them. You know, again, maybe it was like they just decided to spontaneously go off somewhere on a summer's day, but they wouldn't do that, so. And again, there'd be a no-show at work. The next day, then, a couple more friends would pop over, you know, more people becoming worried about Danielle and Saren, and they would, they would go over into their room, have a look around, any clues as to where they could have gone, they would find Saren's wallet, they would find Danielle's glucose meter, she had, she had the diabetes, you know, they found a couple of things that's like, this is not, you, uh, hmm, this is weird as, that. It's weird. <laughs> it was then on the 26th of August that Danielle's brother, Kevin, and his girlfriend, Aaron, they were becoming really, really worried. Like, so that was kind of weird because the family kind of became worried last. But then they were like, okay, this is getting really, really weird as shit. I mean, at the start, you know, they're thinking, she's fine. She's grand, you know. You guys are worrying about nothing. Well, now they're worrying about something. Kevin went into Danielle's room, looking around the place, seeing what he could see. Again, any clues as to a note, maybe that somebody missed, whatever. He's walking around and he, so he started, then he started looking out the window, uh, out, outside their window into the yard, the family's yard, to see if there was maybe somebody crying through a window or something like that. And he saw that the grass outside was really trampled, really disturbed as if there had been, you know, activity there. So Kevin went out to investigate and he clues out here maybe. He didn't really see a whole lot during that hot summer day but he did notice a lot of flies, like a lot of flies. You know that like good feeling you get when you just know something is wrong. It's like you can't consciously see or hear anything, but your subconscious is picking up that this is not okay. There's something is very, very wrong here. It's like you heard something without hearing it. You saw something without noticing it, but your brain is picking up that we have a problem. That's definitely what Kevin was having at this stage. And he saw the flies were growing the closer you got to the shed. Kevin got the key out for the shed and he unlocked it, opened the door, and the flies just began to spread. Inside was a lawnmower and a couple of other things which they pulled out, out of the way, so they could get a clear look into what was going on around here. And at the back of the shed, they saw two large black plastic bags. Joseph had arrived at this stage to see what was going on. They got out a box cutter, sliced it. They saw a leg. The police were then called. Nine one, where is your Hello? emergency? Hello? Hello, nine one. Hi, I need someone to come to my house immediately. Okay, what's going on over there? Well, my sister's been missing for four or five days. Her and her boyfriend. 
And we just found two bags in the shed, and it flies all. I, I think they're in the shed in, in a bag, okay? And I'm just scared to open it. Okay, we don't want you to touch anything, okay? Because if it is something no. like that, there's going to be evidence, okay? We stopped. Okay, we stopped. you said there's how many bags in that shed? There's like five bags, but these two are the ones with flies all over them, okay? Can you just get someone here to check? Yep, we're getting everyone on the way. What's your name? Uh, Kevin. Kevin Marzaka. Over here, please. Uh, sir. Hi. Hey. So what, what's, what's going on here? So, my sister, her his daughter, has been missing for five days now. Okay. I did a walk around the house to check if there's any trails or anything suspicious. I've seen a boatload of flies behind the shed. And when I pulled things out, we we have these bags like dust in there. filled okay. with flies and, and they don't look good. I can't even. I can't even. So let's just see what we got first. And our, yeah, I mean, we don't even know what we have. That doesn't look normal. Oh yeah, it's dude. We're, oh, yeah. uh, we don't have to cut. We're confirmed. We're confirmed. Confirmed. It's confirmed. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Get everybody out here. In one bag, Danielle. In the other, Saren. Danielle was known as a beautiful soul who would put others before herself. She would give her last dollar to a homeless person who needed it more than she did. Just a great person. Saren a joker, a lot of fun and someone who was always sure to make his friends laugh and put people at ease. This was a horrific tragedy. The police cordoned off the area, right, and, and friends and family arrived. L shock was the only reaction, swiftly followed by heartbreak. How could this have happened though, you know, close friends, like, was it, was it done to themselves? Was it a murder-suicide or something like that? How old is she? 18. Her and her boyfriend, Sarah, is 19 and both missing. They both work with me. I dropped them off after work on Thursday morning. Uh, they've been missing since Thursday at 8 a.m. That's when I dropped them off. That's the last time they were Where seen. Where did you drop them off? Here, their house, after work. That was the last time you saw them? That's the last time anyone saw them. Nothing strange had been seen, uh, you know, by the neighbors, but some people did bring up that they'd seen some kind of darker social media posts about that sort of thing. I mean, and, and that's how Jill, um, you know, the, the mother of Joseph's wife, Danielle's mother, she, that's how she died back in 2011. She had overdosed uh, on, on drugs and passed, sadly passed away that way. So then they're thinking, you know, what kind of effect did that have on Danielle? And did they do something like that? They had posted some dark things, dark humor things on social media. And a lot of people, you know, use dark humor as a crutch. This guy definitely does. Book mining that, we're finding them like this. Clinton Township police say they found two bodies inside garbage bags in a shed behind this mobile home. The same mobile home the woman who was reported missing lives in with her family. 18-year-old Danielle Marzeszka was reported missing by her father, according to police. This is a photo her friends have shared with me and multiple times in social media in their search for her. Police say the family had only recently moved into this mobile home near 16 Mile and Grosbeck. Sunday night around 8.30 p.m., police say they were called to investigate a horrific discovery made in the shed. Police believe one of those two bodies found is a woman, but they do not yet have the identities confirmed or the cause of death. That's what those around them were thinking. The police very soon had other inclinations as to what happened. Both were in a steady state of decomposition. Saren had been wrapped in five plastic bags. Three were around his head and neck, one around his upper body, and one around his lower body. His mouth was covered in duct tape. The duct tape has probably actually been over his nose too, but it had like slipped down. His wrists and ankles had been bound too. Danielle, she'd been wrapped in three bags, one just around her entire body, then two around her head and her neck. She too duct taped up and both victims, Danielle and Saren, had severe head fractures. Somebody had gone to town. So both tied up, beaten, you know, severely, and then, and then dumped in this horrific way in the shed. It would also be determined that even though they suffered those horrific head injuries, it, would, it was unlikely that they were the cause of death. More likely, it would have been asphyxiation after they had been bagged up duct tape all around their mouth and their nose, they suffocated inside those bags. They were only wearing underwear and neither had signs of self-defense. 
so it perhaps had occurred while they were sleeping. Inside the shed, along with the bodies, they found a plastic bag with some bloody items, including a rubber hammer that was likely the, the attacking weapon, pillows, more duct tape, and a sheet that would have come from their bed. And bringing Luminol into the bedroom, it lit up. People had been coming and going for days, and it was under their nose the entire time. An entire bloodbath right there. And more bloody items were found stuffed inside the closet. The investigation swiftly turned on those around the two victims, and more specifically, the one person who was not there when they were found, Robert Marzejka. A search of the house that day did not reveal him. He had been in the house since they went missing, but he himself would disappear right before they were found. He had left the house and gone to a motel that was six minutes away. As you can imagine, the police desperately wanted to speak with him. Seven years before all of this, Robert had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and paranoia, and had been hospitalized a number of times over the years. Now this is right after his mother, Jill, she passed away. That's when he began hearing voices and so on and so forth. He also refused to believe the doctor's diagnosis. He was not having any of that. He's like, no. So he was like not taking his medication at all, which, you know, not, not great. Not great. He had been working in Detroit, but had recently moved back to Clinton Township, working for the general contractor with his dad. He did have a bit of a drinking problem, but others would say they had no clue of his diagnosis, that he was generally just really well-adjusted. He seemed like a really well-adjusted, normal guy, really nice guy, never had any issues with him or anything like that at all. However, others in the family, you know, they found him to be getting the opposite. He would be getting worse, more aggressive lately, and so on and so forth. Police would announce that he was a person of interest and to keep an eye out for his vehicle. 26 year old Robert Marzeka is a person of interest in this case. He was driving a white 1999 Ford E250 van with license plate DGM 7658 and blue duct tape around the driver's side rear window. I know, I know he was a little lost. Now police are looking for her brother, Robert Marzeka. That day, Robert had been staying at an inn not too far from the family home. And, and like this was, you know, he checked in before the bodies were discovered. Nobody knew this. His family didn't have a clue where he was. He then left the inn, leaving behind his cell phone, his laptop, a few other bits and bobs. He drove in, you know, one of those white work vans to Toledo, just on the border. And it was found from there, he got in one of them good old Greyhound buses all the way to Cincinnati, Ohio. He arrived in Toledo at around 3.45 a.m., but what Robert didn't know was that the police were hunting for him by this stage and had already been to the bus stations handing out photos of him. But Robert, ooh, he had a plan. He was a master of disguise. He was wearing a blonde wig, a hat, and sunglasses. Well, I'll be damned. So the Greyhound employees immediately told the police where he was. At this point, he was in Cincinnati at the Greyhound station and was wandering around for some time before asking an employee if he could use a computer. He had left his behind. They directed him to a nearby library, and when the police got to Cincinnati, they went that away. He was then arrested at the library by US Marshals. Two 
nobody can understand why. Why this happened. The day of the murders, Danielle and Sarah, and they arrived home, you know, at 8 a.m. We can presume that, you know, having just worked an entire night's shift, they just went straight to bed. They would have been in alone, you know, in the house all that time. Robert was the only per other person in the house that day. Now, for when he did what he did, we don't know. But at some point, while they were sleeping, he went into their room. Then, at 1.20 a.m., he ordered a cab, he went from his house, to a, sir, this is a Wendy's. He went to a Wendy's, still covered in blood. Then, shortly before they were found, he went on the run for, I mean, like a bit in his, like, amazing disguise. It's pretty good, to be honest. Robert agreed to return to Clinton Township to face the two charges of murder. Robert's DNA was found on all items. He pleaded not guilty and wasn't very conversational during his court appearances. Robert, he was evaluated by court psychiatrists, and he was found to be competent to stand trial, though, you know, his offence was, you know, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. That's what they were going with, the insanity defence. Due to the long years, you know, the many, many years of untreated mental illness, it's likely he was not in his right frame of mind to do what he did. I mean, no shit. Uh, who does that? Who goes into the bedroom where their sleeping sister and her, and her boyfriend are? with like, who does that? You have to not be in your right frame of mind. But he also never showed any remorse for doing what he did. What he did being going into the bedroom while they were sleeping and bashing their heads in, then tying them up, duct taping their mouths shut where they would asphyxiate and then leaving them in the shed out back and then cleaning the scene. But the issue with this is, after Robert did what, he did what he did, there was a lot of room. There was a lot of time for him to, you know, be back in his right frame of mind. You know, before like going on the run with his like shitty little disguise, looking like an asshole. So instead of realizing, holy shit, I can't believe what I just did, he was like, <laughs> I do not want to be here when they get found. And see the defense, they hired their own doctors to evaluate Robert. And though they, they're the defense's doctors found, yes, he does have, you know, severe mental illness. He was in control of himself at the time of what was happening. Like, he knew what he was doing then. So the insanity defense kind of like, oh, whoops, kind of went away pretty soon after that. They were now hoping for a second degree murder conviction. Did they get one? The motive has never been determined. The only one that comes to mind is, is a loss of the control, but that, that wasn't found to be the case. He knew what he was doing, according to the doctors, and he did it anyway. Something as horrific as this. The jury came back after less than an hour. Guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And I don't want to relitigate the case, but as the court will look at the file, Mr. Uh, Marzeka has had mental illness for a long time. He's heard voices, he's been hospitalized. He's actually been petitioned by his brother, who's present in the court, and by his father. Uh, what happened to uh, Siren that day in Danielle is absolutely horrific. It should not have happened. It shouldn't happen to anybody. And certainly should not have been disposed of or discovered in the manner that they were. I just want the court to keep uh, track of the fact that this was, Your Honor, not to make any excuses or to make a mockery of the judicial system, but it was, in fact, a product of mental illness, and uh, that's well substantiated. The jury just did not uh, see it that way. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you wish to say anything? No. You don't wish to say anything? You murdered your sister, Danielle, and her boyfriend, Sarah, and you don't wish to say anything? No. Right. Well, I, I just want to point out the PSI. It says, the defendant reported that he is in good physical and mental health. So. You don't have much to say, sir, so I don't have much to say except that you're an evil man and you're going where you belong. So the sentence of the court is you place in the Michigan Department of Corrections for a period of life without parole with 500 for three days served. And so ends the story of Robert, his little sister Danielle, and her boyfriend, Saren. Uh, an appeal by Robert was was later denied. I, I don't know if we'll ever know why Robert did what he did and why he never showed any remorse for doing what he had done. It's an incredibly horrific, disturbing, tragic. There's a lot of synonyms you could insert here, but all of them kind of cover it.
Sad story for Danielle and Sarah Bryan, truly is, but it seems like Robert Marzejka is marzejka his way into where he should be. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to leave it there, muchachos. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you being here with me, talking and all this kind of stuff. So thank you. Um, as always, I'll see you real soon, either in a couple of days or whenever, but it'll be real soon, promise. But until then, please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out.